Holy Spirit, come and fill this place with your presence. Embolden us to spread the fire of your Spirit. This day, may we devote ourselves to teaching and fellowship. May we break bread together. And let us pray as Augustine. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. May we never cease to be amazed at your works, and may we always remember that you are with us. Amen. from the Fletchers in Reed Fields. I'm Daniel, this is my wife Christy, and my kids Emily and Ethan. We miss you and love you all, and are so thankful to be part of a church body like this. And uh, even though it is just virtually or remotely, I'm glad we're still able to get together. I can't wait for the day that we're able to all join together in our own home church, though. And I pray that day comes sooner rather than later. Anyway, before we get started, we do have uh, one announcement. As you probably know, the shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder work day is coming up, or work days are coming up. It's the last week of June, the whole week. And um, the time to sign up for that is now. Uh, there's a lot of planning and behind-the-scenes stuff that goes on before that day, or sorry, that week. So uh, please sign up if you are interested. The way to do that is the FBC website and uh, FBC Facebook. Okay, and right now we're going to have my wife and daughter share reading John 17, so if you'd like to follow along, please turn to John 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with, with thee before the world was. I have manifested th thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. 
mine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest I me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have de declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. We will be with him someday, and that's something awesome to remember. But right now we can be all unified and be one. We're the body and he's the head, so we should all be together and like-minded. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day and for this time. I thank you for bringing us together, even though it's via the internet, Lord. Um, I just thank you for bringing us into this church body full of strong believers and people that desire to live for you and have you be in the center of their lives, God. I ask you to help me do the same. Father God, I lift up our government right now um, in everything that's going on. Uh, I pray for the president, the vice president, the governor of each state, the lawmakers, the law enforcement officials. God, the, it's easy to armchair quarterback, uh, Lord, and I just pray that you help me not do that. And um, I just thank you for all the decision makers that we know you put in place, God. I just ask that you would... Uh, lead them by making your will known and undeniable. Don't let us make excuses. Make your will undeniable. So we either have to obey or disobey. And help us obey, Lord. I pray that you'd help us all get through this time. And while doing so, we would be great ambassadors to your son, Jesus Christ. That we would be like him and represent him well in the way we respond to everything that's done, every decision that's made, every law or executive order that's passed, uh, the way people respond to it, uh, the people we run into in the grocery store, on the street and whatnot, Lord, I just ask that you would help us represent Jesus well. Father God, I also pray for our church. I pray for our church leadership and all that's going on with our church, God. I just thank you for giving us uh, godly men and women in our church that uh, desire to do what you would have us do. 
thank you for giving people to this church that desire to follow you, Lord. Please put your hand on all of the leadership and protect them and guide them in all that they're doing right now. And God, I particularly ask you to have your hand on Henry right now and give him every word to speak today. But not only Henry, I ask you to have your hand on us, everyone that's listening, that we would have ears to hear and that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers. I love you, God. I thank you, God. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Amen. Please join me in prayer. 
Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your presence always with us. And Lord, I just praise you for the opportunity to, to share your word today. I pray that, Lord, you'd help me to uh, clearly communicate what you want me to share, the truth of your word. And may we hear what you want to say to us today and make any changes that you want us to make in our lives. Lord, I pray that it will be an encouragement to my brothers and my sisters. And most of all, Lord, that it would give you much glory. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it was a beautiful fall day. Clear, cool, crisp, no wind. It was a pilot's dream. And I'm flying a vintage airplane built in 1939. Few instruments, no radios, which really wasn't a, a problem since I'm flying into a pretty large runway and uh, didn't have a tower, so two-way communications not required. So I come around, made my approach, landed, things look great. Gave it full power, took off, looked up, and there's a small business jet coming right at me. Oh, I bank to the right, he banks to the right, and we continue to have an uneventful flight home. So two pilots attempting to land on the same runway at the same time from opposite directions. And the results obviously could be disastrous. So why do I share that story this morning? Well, one reason is that we're starting to make plans to begin gathering again as a church. And I'm excited about that. However, I just want us to be wise. I want us to be vigilant. Because there's this possibility that coming together could actually drive us apart if we're approaching each other from opposing directions. Jesus prayed that we would be one. One with Him, one with the Father, one with the Trinity. And we know, we know we have an enemy that would do anything to divide us as the body of Christ. So yes, today's message on judging others is prompted by this unique situation that we're living in. But it's also a timeless message. One, I have personally wrestled with long before the coronavirus arrived. Would you turn with me, please, to Romans, Romans chapter 14. And we're going to begin by reading verses 1 through 5. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above the other, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Well, in this context, Apostle Paul is speaking about Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians living under Roman rule in a, in a pagan culture. They're being challenged with eating meat that, that wasn't kosher, according to Old Testament dietary restrictions. It's unclean. And Paul, as well as Jesus, is very clear in the New Testament that, that Christians don't have, that won't become spiritually unclean or, or impure uh, by what they eat. See, this isn't a matter of doctrine. This isn't moral compromise. No one is committing a sin here. This is a matter of disagreement. Judging a brother as weak because of their opinions and their practices. And of course, the conclusion is that we, on the other side, are therefore spiritually strong. I'd like to read the same passage to you out of the message. 
Listen to this. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong in opinion and weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another with a different background might assume he should only be a vegetarian and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. In verse 3, Apostle Paul says, don't, don't judge the one who eats, for God has accepted them. Stop judging. Accept the one who God accepts. He's on to say that he or she is God's servant. And as Christians, we know we all serve just one master, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be very, very careful about who we are pointing that judgmental finger at. So you see, our brother or sister, first and foremost, belongs to God. I remember on a few occasions when I was doing... Uh, marriage counseling, and if I had a couple that was like just really going at each other, sometimes I would say something to the following that, you know, before you attempt to fix your spouse, I want you to try to see the person that you are disrespecting, treating like dirt, verbally abusing. I want you to see them as God's son or daughter, his precious child. I want you to see them that way. And you take it up with God first before you continue again to try to fix your spouse. And so what do we mean by judging? I mean, after all, aren't we supposed to judge sin? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we are commanded to deal with fellow believers engaged in sinful behavior. Anytime they're against God and against His Word. In fact, in, in, uh, throughout the New Testament, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6, we are called, the church is called to, to judge sin. However, calling out a brother in sin is never, never meant to hurt or destroy them. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. We must never forget that the goal of judging sin is always repentance, reconciliation, and restoration. So the judgment we're talking about here, what Paul is talking about is, is to judge. To judge is to form an opinion and a conclusion about someone according to their words or actions. Again, this is not sinful according to Scripture. We become judgmental when we decide that the other person is wrong and possibly even evil. This is when we begin to play Holy Spirit, able to know the thoughts and the intentions of the other person's heart, holding them in contempt and even condemnation. You see, what I'm really saying is not only do I know what you did, I know why you did it. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time is this plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Also, um, I want to read a passage out of James, James chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. James says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James is saying that the source of this kind of judging, it's pride. It's a form of slander. And the slander is actually against God's law, God's word, and, and against God himself, the only one, the true judge who alone can judge with equity and righteousness. In verse 5 of, the, of our text today, it says, uh, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Um, there were these special days, and these Jewish Christians you know, observed them because they were part of ceremonial law. They were traditions woven into the fabric of their lives, just like eating meat or not eating meat. They were a part of their faith. They were a part of their worship. I mean, they were like really important. So the question today is, so what are the things that are so important to us? So important that if a brother or sister does or does not engage in them, we're offended. And we feel justified in judging them. Now, of course, we could spend all morning talking about these things, but I just think of a few in the church, a few traditions, uh, communion, the way we serve communion, the way we take communion, hymns, sacred hymns, versus contemporary worship music. Of course, there's instruments. Hey, 30 years ago, there was no drum kit on this stage or electric guitars. There was a piano over here and an organ over there, and that's what you worshipped with. Nothing else was allowed. Not about baptism. You can sprinkle, you can dip, you can immerse, and there's been, again, Churches divided over that for centuries. Bible versions. Wow, what a controversial subject that one is. And then we go outside the church. The music you listen to. Do you dance or not dance? And where do you dance? And what kind of dancing? And the movies you go to, the movies you watch, the video games you play. Oh, and of course, what you wear. Now, there's a true sign of godliness holding to a particular political position is always open season for judging one another. Throughout my Christian life, social drinking has been like a hot topic. And of course now, it's been replaced with social distancing, wearing a face mask, or not wearing a face mask, following the CDC recommendations or the governor's restrictions. And thanks to social media, we can quickly express our views on how they offend us without seriously considering how we might be offending somebody else with a judgmental attitude. It's amazing how our personal preferences can somehow become someone else's personal problem. Wow. Well, can't we have preferences? Can't we have opinions? Of course we can. And we also can hold deep convictions. We don't have to compromise them. In fact, we can even share them. We just need to stop and ask why. Stop and ask how am I supposed to express them. N never forget, never forget that Christian Communion and fellowship is not dependent upon our agreement on disputable matters, traditions, or practices. My brothers and sisters, it's totally okay to agree to disagree. It's okay. 
Let's continue uh, verses 6 through 12, Romans 14. Paul goes on to say that he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does it for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow before me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So that each of us will give an account of himself to God. I love that. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. So yeah, you can give thanks. Give thanks for your meat. Give thanks for your veggies. Give thanks for the special day that you're observing. See, the focus isn't on that thing. The focus is on the Lord. Is God pleased? Is God glorified? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is addressing eating meat that has been offered in a sacrifice to an idol. In verse 1031, a familiar verse to many of us, he says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I want to read again this passage um, out of the message. Listen to this. So what's important in all this is that if you keep a holy day, keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. If you're vegetarian, eat vegetables for the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. None of us are permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It's God we are answerable to. All the way from life to death and everything in between. Not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again. So that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. In verses 8 and 9, Paul says that Christ is Lord of the living and the dead. Again, the gospel isn't just about heaven when we die. It's about living the abundant life now. It's about honoring God and my brother. Because he says, we, together, we are the Lord's. We come to our kind of our key verse there. In verse 10, it says, But you, you, Henry, you, why do you judge your brother? What gives you the right to do that? In verse 12, it says, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We're, we're all going to stand before Jesus someday. He's the judge. And we're going to give account for ourselves. I'm not going to even account for my brother. However, I may have to give an account on how I treated my brother. Continuing in verse, in verse 13 of our text. 13 to 18 says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything is unclean, to him it's unclean. For because of food your brother is hurt, you're no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, I'll just 
stop there. And I love this section because it, Paul's getting so practical. And I just feel like he's saying, this, this is how you do it. This is how you stop judging others. I mean, Paul taught us this principle of, of put off and, and put on. You find that in Ephesians 4. We find that in Colossians 3. So, of course, of course, we should put off judging one another. But we should also put on Christ-like behavior. And I believe this needs to be a conscious decision. And this is it. I need to determine that I, I will not put any obstacle or stumbling block in my brother's path that could hinder his spiritual growth. Let's go on to, in verse 15, he says, For because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. If we just go up a few verses, um, chapter 13, listen to this in verse 8. Paul says, Owe nothing to anyone except love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that's the, the second part of the great commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your, love your neighbor as yourself. In verse 10, he says, Love does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Listen to what John says in the book of 1 John, chapter 4. He says, we love because he first loved us. So whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister, well, he's a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. And back to our text, Romans chapter 14 and 17, Paul says, if you do this, if you're really loving one another, if you're not judging, you're loving one another, then the kingdom of God, it isn't about eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's how we're supposed to be living. And in verse 18 says, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. By doing this, by loving each other this way, we actually serve Christ. It's acceptable to God the Father, and it's approved or, or pleasing to people. I mean, how, how cool is that? We get to be part of that. That's what the Christian life, that's what the community of faith should look like. Verse 19, so then, we pursue the things which make for peace and building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. So the first principle, I'm not going to put any obstacle in my brother's path that could hinder his spiritual growth. The second one, right here, I will determine, I will put down stepping stones to help build up my brother so that he will grow in grace. Verse 19, he says, pursuing the things which make for peace and building up of one another. In the uh, NIV, it says, for mutual edification. Don't tear down the work of God for the sake of food. The work of God is that mutual edification, the building up of the body, the building up of His church. Stumbling block or stepping stone? My pleasure, 
my, my privilege, my right, or my personal sacrifice for the spiritual welfare of my brother? What an opportunity we have. What a responsibility we have. I believe this is really the essence of discipleship, right? Where Jesus said in the Great Commission to go, go and make disciples. And we do this with the intention of building each other up in the Lord. Uh, and just thinking of that, that verse, go into all the world and make disciples, it, it's just an important reminder that when we're building up one another, we are really building up the church, not just this local church at FA Baptist, but it's the universal church. You know, we have brothers and sisters all over the world. And we just think for a moment about our, our, our missionaries. We get Franco and Barbie serving down in, in Mexico, or the Barleys in Nigeria, the Fords in Israel. You know, what are they experiencing? What are they going through uh, with this pandemic? I know some in Mexico are right now using Google Translate. So how does my interpreted message build them up as believers in Christ? You know, I, I was kind of thinking about maybe a simple step that we all need to take right now in order to stop judging. And maybe we just need to stop talking. We need to stop commenting. Maybe we need to stop, like, giving advice all the time. Bob Berry, in his book, uh, Buying Bacon, which I highly recommend if you uh, as for, to read that, but especially if you own a, a small business. And Bob says that just the, the joy of being financially independent, but also just being content in what you have. He says this, quote, I can walk into Kittery Trading Post knowing I can buy anything there and happily walk out with nothing. I love that. And I thought, man, I, I want that. I want to be able to, to freely walk into the room of current opinions and walk out without saying anything. I need to stop talking. I need to start asking questions. Jesus was a master at asking questions. So go ahead. Go ahead and ask. Ask me. Ask me what I think. Ask me what I feel. Ask me what I believe. Challenge me. Challenge me with your questions to maybe change my view or change my perspective. It's okay. And if I'm wrong according to the truth of God's word, then confront me. Correct me. Just please do it with love and respect so that I know that you have my best in mind. Teach me something new. Inspire me. Again, 1 Corinthians 10 uh, Paul says this, verse 23 and, and 24. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. This is the believer's freedom in Christ. I am free, I'm free from the law. I'm free by his amazing grace. But what's the purpose of the freedom? Just so I can do whatever I want? No. No, he says, I am free. I am free to do what is essential. And that essential is to do what's good for others. What will build them up? To consider what is really best for them. You know, what's beneficial for their spiritual growth? In my freedom... Remember this, 1 Corinthians 8 9. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. I kind of put this into a, what I call my, my freedom test. The exercise of my personal freedom. I have the right to say, to do, and even judge another. But that freedom is to be governed by whether or not it passes this test. Glorifies God, builds up His church, and encourages unbelievers to receive Christ. 
That's the test. Then I'm free. I'm free to do what I want. That glorifies God, builds his church, and encourages those who don't believe to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. And you know, brothers and sisters, just got to stop here and say, hey, we, we all offend each other. I mean, you can't help it. We're human. We're sinners saved by grace. So we are going to offend, offend each other. But we're free. We're free to extend grace. We're free to, to forgive as we have been forgiven. We're free to let our light shine as one so that the world may know that Jesus Christ is Savior, to know him as Savior and Lord before they have to stand before him and judge, as judge. And if you're, if you're listening today and you haven't come to that place, of receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just want to encourage you. I mean, Jesus Christ, he, he really is judge, and he has judged sin. And I, I'm sorry, but he's judged you as a sinner. But the good news is he took that judgment, he took it to the cross. When he died, when he shed his blood, and in that moment, he justified you. He made you right with God. Clean. <laughs> Forgiven. Free from the penalty of your sin. So that you could live. Live now and have eternal life with him. And if you haven't experienced that yet, please, I just encourage you. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The one who loves you the one who died for you, the one who lives for you. So let's read our last couple verses. Romans 14, 22, 23. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating and it's not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. And I've got to recognize it. You know, I can't condemn my brother by judging him. That's impossible. Like I just said, he's been forgiven. You know, really, I'm, I'm only really condemning myself. And Paul's saying, you know, if I want to be happy, <laughs> really content, I need to live by faith. I need to be convinced and convicted that what I'm doing is really in agreement with God's word and his will. That it really does glorify him. It really does build up my brother and sister. And it really is a witness to the world that's watching. And I believe that is what it means to be spiritually strong and not weak. 2020. Well, it'll be a... A year to never be forgotten, right? It'll go in the history books. Generations to come. You know, what am I going to remember from this year? Maybe a better question is, what will I be remembered for? What will we at Fayette Baptist Church, what are we going to be remembered for? Well, I just want to imagine this. Imagine, imagine if people remembered us and thought of the words of Winston Churchill. This was their finest hour. This was the year that they were transformed by testing. This was the year that they died. They died to themselves and truly learned to love, to serve, to pray, set priorities, and put people first. This was the year that we stopped judging each other, brothers and sisters. This is the year that we stood up against what divides us and fought for what makes us one in Christ. Familiar verse, Hebrews 10, 25. It says, don't forsake the gathering together. You know, and I don't believe we've done that. In fact, I believe we've really stayed together through this time of separation, isolation. We have worked very hard at being connected. 
We have loved each other during this very difficult season. So now as we plan and make plans to, to gather again physically, I just pray that we will strive to put into practice Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. To God be the glory.
having Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear And what a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer What peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God and pray Everything to God in prayer 